Hi again and welcome to the second part of your video lesson on conditioning and the behaviourist approach. So now in this second shorter part of the video we're going to take a look at operant conditioning. So operant conditioning was first introduced by a guy called Edward Thorndike and it is different to classical conditioning in the sense that um, Edward Thorndike instead proposed that animals and humans learn actually by a process of trial and error. He argued that humans and animals initially spontaneously produce certain behaviours but then it's the consequences of those actions that decide whether or not we choose to repeat it or avoid that behaviour again. So all this behaviour occurs by chance initially but then it's the consequential actions afterwards that dictate whether or not it's a behaviour that we learn i.e. we go on to repeat it or we fail to learn, we don't acquire it and we thus avoid it in future. So all operant conditioning states that learning is consequential okay it's based on trial and error it's based on that the kind of response to our actions and this is known as the law of effect now edward thorndike was quite keen to point out um that human beings and animals are much more likely to repeat a behavior that is followed by a pleasant consequence. Now what he argued, hence it's our one and only law in psychology, is that a pleasant consequence or an act of reinforcement does actually increase the likelihood that we are going to repeat that behaviour. It's the one and only certainty that we have in psychology that all humans, all animals, if they are rewarded for something, that increases the likelihood they're going to do it again. It doesn't necessarily mean that they will certainly do it again. It's not as clear cut as that, but it absolutely increases the likelihood that we want to repeat it. OK, so that, as I've said, is known as the law of effect. Likewise, he also argued that any negative consequence to an action will thus lower the likelihood of it being repeated. Again, it's not crystal clear, it's not clear cut, it's not a certainty, but it takes the likelihood of it down, okay? So any positive consequence normally will result in repetition, any negative consequence will result in a behaviour being avoided, thus it isn't repeated. So those positive and negative consequences that I referred to then on the previous slide, we often classify these as reinforcement and punishment. OK, now. Edward Thorndike's um, original theory was built upon by a guy called Burhaus Skinner, who you're going to look at his research in a couple of moments. But Skinner noticed that it wasn't just positive and negative consequences. So there weren't just two consequential actions um, that we were responding to as animals and humans. In actual fact, he discovered that there were two different types of reinforcement and that there were two different types of punishment. They all are important to your understanding of operant conditioning. So we're going to run through these now and then we're going to do a couple of little tasks just to check that you've understood the differences between them. So we're going to start on the left hand side and we're going to deal with reinforcement initially. OK, so reinforcement, if you think of it this way, as it says in black at the bottom of the screen, reinforcement always increases the likelihood of a behaviour being repeated, okay? So that's in all circumstances. If an act is reinforced, then it increases the likelihood that it will be repeated. However, according to Skinner, there are two different ways in which that reinforcement can be achieved. These are known as positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement, and they are very different to one another. So you need to pay attention to how these are achieved. So positive reinforcement, if we think of the word positive in a very kind of mathematical sense, positive is an addition, okay? So if it's a, an addition of something that is gonna increase the likelihood that we repeat that behavior again, then positive reinforcement has quite simply got to mean we are adding something pleasant to that situation, okay? So being rewarded with praise, for example, is a nice straightforward example of a positive reinforcement. We are adding in something pleasant the compliment or the praise, and that thus increases the likelihood that we want to repeat that action. 
So that's positive. That's adding something pleasant. Negative reinforcement works slightly differently. It still increases the likelihood that we want to repeat the behaviour, but it, it actually involves removing something from the situation. Hence, the word negative comes into play here. So negative reinforcement is still going to increase the likelihood that we want to do it again, but we are removing something that we find unpleasant from the situation okay so let's imagine for a second that you are grounded okay the action that we are going to be repeating again is vacuuming the living room okay so you are grounded you perform the action of hoovering the living room and your parent says to you that you are no longer grounded. That is an act of negative reinforcement. You are learning to repeat the action of hoovering the living room by removing the unpleasant effect of being grounded. So you are taking something that you don't enjoy away from the situation and that encourages you to repeat the action that led to that being the case. So in this case, the hoovering will be repeated because the grounding has been removed. So both of those are acts of reinforcement, increasing the likelihood that it'll be repeated. On the right hand side, we now need to just take a quick look at punishment. Now, punishment has the opposite effect on our behaviour. So this decreases the likelihood of you repeating that behaviour. So the same kind of rules apply in terms of positive and negative, that positive is adding something to the situation, negative is taking something away. So if we're referring to an act of positive punishment, this is simply, simply adding something that you find unpleasant, which will hopefully stop you from repeating that behaviour again. Okay, again, if we just use a, a rough example of kind of behavior in the household if you do something naughty as a child um so for example you i don't know you throw a, a toy as a young child you throw a toy at one of your younger siblings then an act of positive punishment would be being told off for it or maybe a slap on the wrist that is adding something um, unpleasant to the situation which is an act of punishment and hopefully that child will learn that the act of throwing the toy at their younger younger sibling should not be repeated okay it's decreased in its likelihood negative punishment is the more powerful form of punishment so negative punishment is where we are taking something away that we enjoy again household behaviors household chores if you were to misbehave in a similar way so you hurt one of your siblings an act of negative punishment might be that your parent might take away your computer or might take away your mobile phone. So they are removing something that you enjoy as a consequence for your action of hurting your sibling. That therefore decreases the likelihood that you will go ahead again and hurt your sibling because your phone has been removed as a consequence. So hopefully just running through that slide there has allowed you to understand the difference between reinforcement and punishment and that there are two different types of both reinforcement and punishment. So if we go into our booklet now, okay, there is a little grid for you to complete based on what we've just learned about there. So if you go ahead now and just pause this video, copy the relevant uh, answers into your booklet, and then I'll just take a moment to explain them once you've got those written down. So pause it here. OK, so now that we've got those written in, I just want to clarify the examples for you. Some of them are very similar to what I'd said on the previous slide. So positive reinforcement, an example would be getting a pay rise for meeting a deadline that encourages you to meet your deadlines in future. You repeat that action. Negative reinforcement, an example would be taking away detention for good behaviour. So I gave you the example of taking away grounding, similar thing. It means that the good behaviour will be repeated by taking away the detention. Positive punishment, shouting at a child for swearing. So thus the swearing will hopefully be avoided in future. And negative punishment, taking away a child access to the living room and the TV. So therefore, they're going to avoid um, bad behaviour in future. 
So now that we've kind of get into grips with those concepts, I'd like you to take a moment, again, pause the video in a second and complete the example worksheet that I gave you uh, in class. I'm not going to give you the right answers to this. We will mark them up in lesson instead. So pause this here and you decide whether they are actions of positive or negative reinforcement or positive or negative punishment. Okay, so hopefully we now get into grips with some real life examples, but what we also need in order to understand operant conditioning is Bearhouse Skinner's research. So the original idea of operant conditioning was put forward by Thorndike, but I did mention at the start of this video that Skinner really did develop operant conditioning. And he investigated operant conditioning using rats and using this piece of equipment that he dubbed the Skinner box which looked a little bit like this, okay? Now, you are gonna have the opportunity to watch a little video clip which outlines uh, the Skinner box and kind of how it works. That's posted onto your assignment in Teams as well. So you can always pause that now if you want to, go ahead and watch that video clip. But I'll just give you a quick run through in terms of the, the Skinner box and what the basic components were. So what you can see in the center of the screen is a wrap placed into said Skinner box, okay? In front of the rat is a lever. Now, if we just return to the original quote from Thorndike, the animals and humans perform spontaneous actions, and then it's the consequences which decide or dictate whether or not the action is going to be repeated. So when this, the rat is originally placed into the Skinner box, it will wander around frantically a lot of the time, but by accident, it will often press the lever. Now, the first time that the rat hits the lever, a pellet of food will be dispensed into the Skinner box. OK, now, because it happened accidentally to begin with, the rat might not immediately make the connection between the two. But the more the rat presses the lever by accident, the more it learns that pressing the lever will dispense a food pellet. Hence, we've got positive reinforcement. By pressing the lever, they get the food. They learn to repeat the action of pressing the lever. So we've got positive reinforcement going on in the Skinner box. We also have, though, negative reinforcement. And Skinner was quite clever in the way that he developed the Skinner box to try and demonstrate negative reinforcement. So same thing, the rat, a different rat on this occasion, will be placed into the Skinner box. What will happen is that the red light in front of the rat will signal. About 20 seconds after the red light shining, the electric grid underneath the rat's feet will start to um, uh, start to give a charge. Okay, so the floor becomes electrified. Now, frantically, again, usually, chaotically, the rat kind of runs around the Skinner box initially and it will accidentally press the lever. In pressing the lever in this second trial, the electric grid gets switched off. Now, this is repeated again accidentally for the first few run throughs, but quite quickly, the rat starts to learn that it is getting a signal, okay? It's giving a pre-warning, okay? That in 20 seconds time, that electric grid is going to be switched on. And it also learns that by pressing the lever, that the electric grid below its feet will be switched off. It then learns by a negative reinforcement that as soon as that red signal lights on, if it presses the lever, it won't get the electric grid switched on. So that is negative reinforcement. It's not punishment, it's negative reinforcement because the behavior of the lever pressing is being repeated, hence it's reinforcement. But it is negative reinforcement because the action of pressing the lever moving, apologies for that, is removing the electric grid. OK, so that's never, ever punishment. So try not to get confused with that. It's removing the electric grid in the hope that the rat learns to keep pressing the lever, an act of repetition. So if we go ahead now and have a look at the little spaces in your booklet, and we're going to fill these in together. So as I've just described to you there, the rat moves around the cage and when it accidentally presses the lever, food is delivered into the cage. This is an example of positive reinforcement and it results in the rat repeating the behaviour, it continues to press the lever.
In another experiment, the rat is subjected to an unpleasant stimulus in the form of an electric shock. If the rat presses the lever, this would turn off the electric grid. This is an example of negative reinforcement and so results in the rat repeating the lever pressing behaviour. So that is a quick outline of operant conditioning and the different of four different consequential consequential actions rather and also a quick run through of the Skinner box. That's all of your content completed there so you're not writing anything else into your booklet but what I would like you to do now at the end of this video lesson is try and complete the exam questions that I've set to you. So we can see here we've got a multiple choice again no um, right answers are provided to you we'll mark them up on Monday. So there's a multiple choice there is a three mark question asking you to just briefly outline Skinner's research. So that's a description of Skinner's box. There is an application style question asking you to explain how the ideas of reinforcement might be used in a primary school to encourage children to pick up litter from the playground. Again, worth three marks. And then there is an extended response question, which is split into two parts. So the first part asks you for a difference between classical and operant conditioning. And the second part requires you to read the stimulus and ask what type, you're asked, sorry, to explain what type of reinforcement is being used by the teacher in that situation. And then finally, we've got application of classical conditioning to the acquisition of a phobia. So take your time with this one. It would be very similar in process to the Little Albert scenario. So think carefully about how all the terminology might apply in this situation. So that's all of the work that I would like you to complete on conditioning. And as I've said, we will mark up everything that you have done on Monday's lesson. Okay, thank you.